Hey everyone, my name is Chris Neal and this is a case study of the Deepwater Horizon. Let's start with the background. Texas City, March 23rd, 2005. This refinery was one of BP's largest. It was built in 1934 and as a result, a lot of the infrastructure was highly obsolete and outdated and needing to be replaced. BP had purchased the Texas City oil refinery from Amoco and it was part of a gigantic buyout of BP buying out multiple companies. And following that, they were trying to cut costs by 25% to boost their profit margin. And as a result, a lot of the upgrades that needed to be made, a lot of the structural integrity issues that need to be addressed were just ignored altogether. And eventually on March 23rd, 2005, a unit called the isomerization unit of the Texas City oil refinery failed it exploded and there was a fire that resulted in 15 deaths with an additional 170 personnel injured. BP paid off the victims and their families a total of a billion dollars in exchange for all of them signing non-disclosure agreements, except for one lady, Eva Rowe. She refused to settle originally and instead demanded answers. And eventually she would get her answers where BP released 7 million internal documents they also donated $32 million to various charities and paid Eva Rowe an undisclosed amount. On top of this, they faced $71 million in federal fines. Now, since this incident, there have been four other deaths, which shows that some of these structural and infrastructure errors that needed to be addressed still have not been. And in June 2010, the Texas City refinery released toxic gases for 40 days. There's still an ongoing investigation into that incident by the EPA. Furthermore, into the background, another refinery in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. On March 2nd, 2006, there was a leak from a burst pipeline at the Prudhoe Bay refinery where 260,000 gallons of oil leaked from the pipeline. And in an investigation, it was discovered that the CEOs and the higher executives had ordered the workers at the Prudhoe Bay refinery to stop pigging the pipelines. Now, pigging is a term they use for cleaning out the pipelines. So just like you need to change the oil in your vehicle, if you don't, it will get clogged and there'll be a lot of sediment and deposits. Uh, just like that, the pipelines here at this Prudhoe Bay, Alaska refinery ended up getting clogged. Uh, there was corrosion, there was rust. And as a result, this leak happened. The CEO, John Brown, and some experts decided to visit Alaska and they assured the public it was an isolated incident. Unfortunately, two days later, another spill occurred at the exact same refinery there in Alaska and they were forced to shut down their operations and until an investigation was complete. After that investigation, it was found that 19 British Petroleum Pipeline inspectors were either found to be unqualified to perform the inspections or they had not been trained at all. And as a result, 13,000 inspection points had to be re-inspected. And this is still taking place. They're still having to go back over these 13,000 inspection points. Let's talk a little bit about the Deepwater Horizon. So the U.S was highly encouraging deep water oil exploration. They wanted to get rid of their dependency on oil in the Middle East. And BP was all in for this. They were the leading operator producing 25% of all the oil in the Gulf. There was a oil rig called the Thunder Horse. This was BP's first deep water rig. It was their prototype, if you will. And because of Hurricane Dennis, the Thunder Horse actually collapsed in the Gulf of Mexico. However, it was found that after an investigation, there was a check valve installed backwards, which caused the Thunder Horse to take on water, and it was unable to shed this water because this valve was backwards. Following uh, the third incident, this being the third, there was the Texas City incident, there was the Prudhoe Bay incident, now the Thunder Horse incident, there's three strikes and you're out. So John Brown as the CEO resigned. 2007, Tony Hayward took over. President Obama at the time announced a major expansion of offshore oil exploration. Unfortunately, 10 days after his announcement, 
It was April 20th, 2010, and this was when the Deepwater Horizon failed catastrophically, resulting in 11 fatalities with an additional 17 individuals injured. There were internal documents that show BP was over budget on the Deepwater Horizon project by $10 million. They were trying to cut corners wherever they could. There were many things that they did not do that were considered industry standards in order to save money. One of these is a cement bond log. That was a structural integrity test. Another was cutting the amount of pipe centralizers to secure and plug the well. This saved them another million. BP also removed heavy drilling mud. This is also a structural integrity part. This saved them approximately $2 million. Following an investigation, there were executives from major oil companies, including Rex Tillerson of ExxonMobil. They testified in front of Congress, and they stated that BP ignored industry standards in order to save costs. The scope of the spill. So there were over 205 million gallons of oil dumped out into the Gulf of Mexico over, over 87 days. This is by far the largest spill in U.S. history. The coastlines affected were of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. There were first responders that used 10.4 million feet of what's called sorbent boom to collect and absorb the oil. Now, there were controlled burns, there were the sorbent booms, there were even skimming vessels, but these, these didn't clean up nearly all of it. And unfortunately, there were over 8,000 animals native to the Gulf Coast reported dead in six months following the spill. Approximately 30,000 personnel deployed in response with 57,000 539 square miles of Gulf waters remaining remained closed to fishing to this day. Some of the groups affected, obviously BP, uh, their losses were mostly financial. Transocean was the owner of the rig. BP was leasing it. Halliburton had contractors working on the rig. Obviously the employees and the families, the, uh, the individuals that lost their lives and, and sustained injuries. Consumers, they were affected at the gas pump. Wildlife and wetlands, uh, hundreds of thousands of birds were reported dead. And fishing and tourism, especially for Louisiana and Florida, that was a big dent to their economy. The impact to wildlife, as depicted in the slide, uh, there was a large increase in dolphin deaths and in uh, dolphins born with birth defects. Now there was also needing there was also a need to replace foraging habitat for ducks and other migratory birds. This slide depicts the oil residue collected just from June 2011 through March of 2013. This isn't even the full scope of it, but this kind of gives you an idea of just how much. This slide depicts the 11 individuals that lost their lives. The financial losses for BP, approximately $61.6 billion in total. And these following bullets break down where the $61.6 billion comes from. Long-term effects, as you can see from the bullet points on the slide, the majority of long-term effects are of habitat, ecological, and wildlife in nature. And uh, unfortunately, from the research that I've done, it is still ongoing. The long-term effects, we have still yet to see exactly what, what's going to happen with those since it's only been approximately seven years. And uh, another issue with these long-term effects are actually the workers that were there to clean up the spill. Those approximately 30,000 first responders, um, the kinds of chemicals that were used to clean up the oil, that had a, a health effect on a lot of those workers. And so there's actually an ongoing study of that taking place as well. So there are two major lessons that I learned in all of my research, and the first is that BP has the business model of saving money 
on upgrades and infrastructure and instead they would rather let something bad happen and then pay off the individuals involved instead of just paying for it up front. Uh, the second lesson I learned is that the U.S. needs to hold companies more accountable and actually do something about it when these companies do something wrong. Some of the first responders to the incident, the Department of Homeland Security, in conjunction with them, the U.S. Coast Guard falling under them, and also the private sector uh, played a huge role in the cleanup and response process. Unfortunately, with the DHS and the U.S. Coast Guard, there was a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape, and a lot of that got in the way of their incident management team trying to actually deploy and clean up this mess. However, the private sector developed and had on hand a lot of tools like the sorbent boons to clean up and absorb the oil that played a vital role in the cleanup. Some of the roadblocks to response were uh, missed opportunities to burn off more of the oil because overblown air pollution concerns. There was also holdups in the use of dispersants there were permit delays in allowing the state of Louisiana to create artificial barriers against the encroaching oil slick. There was also failure to waive regulatory pro prohibitions against foreign assistance. Uh, that would be like letting foreign skimming vessels come into United States waters to help. Had we let a lot of skimming vessels from foreign nations enter our waters to help, that could have tripled our efforts and tripled our personnel. And unfortunately, because of the red tape and because of the bureaucracy, a lot of that was either delayed or didn't happen at all. And there was failure to approve barges and booms in time to block oil from reaching Alabama's Magnolia River, which suffered greatly. The current situation, as depicted on this slide and the following slide, the states of Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi and Florida and even Alabama, they all have statewide agencies that are leading the rehab and restoration of their coastlines along with receiving some financial aid some from the federal government. This has been a case study of the Deepwater Horizon. My name is Chris Neal. Thank you.